What evidence do we have of imagination in our ancestors? Since imagination itself does not leave fossils, the best we have to go on is artifacts, such as stone tools. Do stone tools suggest evidence that planning and intentionality went into their construction? It now seems that the very first stone tools may have been made by our Australopithecine ancestors, such as this reconstruction of a female Australopithecus, as long ago as 3.3 million years ago. In fact, stone tools may have been an important factor in the transition between the Australopithecus genus and our own later genus Homo, which might itself have appeared as long ago as 2.8 million years ago. There's a site called Lomikwi 3 near Lake Turkana, where Australopithecine tools from 3.3 million years ago were found. They were not made by just smashing rocks together. Rather, they were napped, which means that they were intentionally flaked off from an initial core rock. We know this because the flakes fit into the core and the core had to be rotated between successive strikes, each of which would have cracked off a sharp flake. Their tools were primitive for sure, but the journey of a thousand miles always starts with the first small steps. When I was in grad school, I learned that the first intentionally made stone tools were the Olduin tools made by Homo habilis around 2.2 million years ago, but new findings have pushed this much further back in time now to at least 3.3 million years ago, and it'll probably be pushed further back still with yet newer findings. Olduin tools were napped indicating the existence of an intentional plan held in working memory before the stone was ever struck. Here's an example from Olduvai Gorge that's estimated to be 1.8 million years old. And here are some from what's now Ethiopia from 1.7 million years ago. Especially some of the more complex examples of Olduin tools suggest to me that their crafters had something in mind that they were aiming to achieve. They were certainly not just picking through sharp shards after smashing rocks together haphazardly. Later, starting after 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus made a much more complex and clearly intentional tool set called the Acheulean tool set. The most characteristic tool was the Acheulean hand axe. Even though this teardrop-shaped hand axe is beautiful in its form and simplicity, what I find most surprising about it is that its form and method of production hardly changed over more than a million and a half years, from almost 1.8 million years ago until perhaps as recently as 130,000 years ago. That might well be close to 100,000 generations of little innovation. It's as if Homo erectus had one good idea and stuck with it. The teardrop shape is found over this vast time and over most of their territory. It's as if Homo erectus had an innate, genetically programmed template for the construction of this particular axe, much like bowerbirds have an innate program for constructing complex nests. So even though Homo erectus must have been able to plan to make the Acheulean hand axe before making it, the creativity and innovativeness that defines our modern imagination was apparently weak or missing. Of course, we can't know for sure that they lacked a creative imagination like ours. All we can say is that we find little evidence in support of the existence of a powerful imagination. So while there had to be imagination in the sense of planning a complex tool and executing a tricky sequence of production, Homo erectus appears to have exhibited little in the way of innovative imagination. As far as we can tell, by at the latest, 315,000 years ago, there was a revolution in tool manufacture known as the Levallois Technique. An animation of this technique is shown here. It involved napping flakes off of a core in a particular sequence, each of which could be used as a blade or spear or other projectile point, such as these shown here. It also resulted in a long blade that could be used as a scraper or knife, such as these examples shown here. Because the form of the final product, namely the long knife, had to be held in working memory while striking off the flakes, this suggests to me an advance in planning and sequencing ability, as well as an advance in working memory capacity and its operations. In effect, the executors of this technology had to imagine the knife that they wanted, 
find a rock that had this knife potentially in it, and then remove the extraneous portions of rock to free the knife from the stone. The oldest examples of this type of stone tool so far have been found in what is now Morocco at a site called Jebel Irhud. Initially, the bones found there were classified as Neanderthal, but they have since been reclassified as the earliest members of our own species, Homo sapiens, which might have looked something like this, reconstruction of our species 300,000 years ago. Their stone tools were more sophisticated than the Acheulean tool set of Homo erectus and more versatile. It's probable that the Levallois technique spread across Eurasia and Africa from wherever it was invented, including to the Neanderthals. Since this napping technique is counterintuitive and requires numerous steps, it might be that it could only have been taught if some form of language existed, although this is just a hunch and likely cannot be proven. The Levallois technique for making stone tools developed slowly into the Mousterian tool set that reigned from about 160,000 years ago until the demise of the Neanderthals about 40,000 years ago. But again, what is surprising to me about this is how little the Mousterian tool set changed over tens of thousands of years. The Neanderthals, despite having bigger brains than ours, appear not to have been terribly imaginative, at least compared to us, in the particular sense of not being very innovative. That said, the Neanderthals were cognitively our sister species. They may have made some kinds of art and appear to have deliberately buried their dead in ways perhaps indicative of a symbolic understanding of the universe. For example, 175,000 years ago in what is now France, Neanderthals arranged stalactites into circles. Why? Nobody knows. Then sometime around 41,000 years ago, our species, which might have first appeared around 315,000 years ago in Africa, shows up with its revolutionary new cognitive design in the middle of Central Europe. Some people call these new people the Cro-Magnon. It is quite possible that they came up the Danube River and went as far as you can go, which would be the source of the Danube in what is now southern Germany. All around this area lie caves, and in these caves, the most amazing artifacts can be found. These artifacts provide evidence of deep imagination. We find representational art in these European caves. My favorite artifact is one called Löwenmensch because it has a lion's head on a human body. It might be as old as 40,000 years old and is almost surely older than 30,000 years old. Since no human actually has a lion's head, someone had to imagine the strange being first and then go build it in the world. In addition, we find complex art and jewelry and even evidence of musical instruments. In addition, there's the first undeniable evidence of symbolic thinking. For example, here we see the Blanchard plaque. We don't know what is depicted here. Phases of the moon? A record or count of some long forgotten series of events? There's no way to know, but whatever was being represented, it clearly was done intentionally by our ancestors and reveals an awareness of patterns in space and time that may have been unnoticed by earlier species in our lineage. And even if what is represented is not some imaginary being, there seems to be an unprecedented appreciation of beauty. Here's a couple of lovely examples of representational art from about 29 to 25,000 years ago from what's now the Czech Republic. Even though such artifacts show up quite suddenly in Europe, almost surely with the arrival of our species there, there are examples of jewelry and art from Africa that precede the European examples by tens of thousands of years. Here are some examples from the Blombos Cave of South Africa that are probably between 70 and 80,000 years old. This stone, for example, dated to 73,000 years ago, predates European examples of art by 30,000 years. One thing that I find puzzling is that the human brain, at least as evidenced by skulls, had its fully modern external form by at least 130,000 to even perhaps as long ago as 200,000 years ago. However, the first strong evidence we have of art, musical instruments, and jewelry only shows up after 100,000 years ago. Maybe we haven't found those older artifacts yet, or maybe something happened that led to the behavioral changes required to make such artifacts. Was that some kind of change in neural circuitry? The advent of language? Changes in culture? Perhaps we'll never know. 
Some archaeologists claim that there is evidence of art or symbolic processing in Neanderthals or even in Homo erectus, but what strikes one really is the paucity of such evidence. For example, some have claimed that these scratches on a shell from over half a million years ago, so Homo erectus, represent something like art. Some have argued that this pebble, found in what is now Israel, might comprise the first evidence of art already from a quarter of a million years ago. But compare this to the stone figures found after the arrival of our species in Europe, and it's hard to see this as just a change in degree. It appears to be a change in kind. We became able to conceive of such art in our imaginations and then go create such objects in the world. Of course, even if the Neanderthals or even if Homo erectus could make art, that would not explain how the capacity for imaginative and artistic cognition began in our lineage. Perhaps the move to abstract cognition precedes the 100,000-year horizon that I tend to adhere to. But whenever this new capacity to imagine and innovate began, it had to involve some change in human information processing, either due to changes in brain function or some change in culture, such as language, or perhaps both. Again, the artifacts I find most impressive are those of objects that do not exist in the world, such as the Leuvenmensch from 30 to 40,000 years ago, or this cave painting of a deer-headed man from perhaps 13,000 years ago. What kind of mental operations in the mental workspace or working memory could have created such fantastic representations before the imaginer went and produced them in the world? Whatever these operations were that could create the Leuvenmensch later underlay the creation of great art or the complex abstract models of physics. In conclusion, the beginnings of complex planning, intentionality, sequencing, and indeed imagination are evidence already in the napped stone tools of our Australopithecine ancestors over three million years ago. These capabilities grew in complexity over tens of thousands of generations, but there appears to have been a sudden increase in innovativeness with the advent of our species, particularly within the last 100,000 years. Our goal must be to try to understand what volitional mental operations could have given rise to the possibility of imagining the Leuvenmensch and eventually to the imagining of more abstract ideas, whether airplanes, computers, or democracy.